mental health. It's known as a series of ebbs and flows, ups and downs, a constant wave that we have to maintain. So we're told to do things for self-care, like stay hydrated, be mindful, and experts are hired to make our living arrangements a little less stressful. But we can't expect everyone to live in the most mentally healthy way, and that's something we can't mandate. So, what if as the agent individuals that we are, we decide that stress management is a low priority for us, in comparison to things like school, work, or supporting family? Or what if, despite our best intentions to live a mentally healthy lifestyle, we still find ourselves struggling? When I went to first year university, I had a one-track mind of getting into medical school. I was a pretty good high school student, had great grades, knew how to study, and stress was never an issue for me. Pressure was always motivating. But the transition from high school to university is a little more than reading a harder textbook. It was a new lifestyle, new social support networks, and a new way of spending money. <laughs> I eventually found myself spiraling into a cycle of self-hate, jealousy, and eventually mental illness. I started getting these panic attacks at 2 a.m. at night, and the only things within arm's reach were those like really intimidating hotline cards and text-heavy pamphlets full of descriptive texts. Calling up a stranger on a formal national crisis hotline is scary, and I did not want to read paragraphs of text when I felt like I was going to die. No one likes to read about how wet water is when they're drowning. My point is, the resources that were already there were not enough for me. Yeah. I eventually did recover with years, years of self-practice, months of medication and therapy. But you don't need a diagnosed illness in order to experience the symptoms of depression or anxiety, just like how you don't need the flu to have a sore throat. But the coping skills I did have to learn for recovery came in extremely handy in second year when I fell physically ill. And I had to get some pretty invasive surgery that gave me limitations that made pursuing medicine impossible. It was a very confronting experience, and it made me realize how life was really limited down to the hours and the minutes and the seconds in the present, and it only makes sense to make those seconds of living more enjoyable. The way that our society is set up and structured has a great influence on our mental health and well-being, and we should definitely strive to build a world where we don't need to choose between school and work and mental health. And there are great strides made in this direction, like promoting healthier workplace culture, getting more affordable living spaces, and working for better academic environments. But all these great things take time, and even in the most perfectly engineered environment, we can't eliminate stress. It's part of the human experience. And we're always going to have to address that gap between the onset of stress symptoms to treatment, or even until we want to seek treatment. <coughs> Formal supports like counseling services and group therapy have a difficult time reaching people who don't see themselves at risk of mental illness. But we still need to design for supports for these groups if they ever encounter a stressor that is so overwhelming they don't know how to manage. Groups like intelligent university students thinking that nightly insomnia and daily excessive worry is a normal rite of passage in academia. And it is not, and it has no right to be. Informal health supports, supports outside of that formal mental health system, might have the ability to reach these groups in ways that formal services can't. But they need to be usable, accessible, and cooperative with what already exists. In third year, I had an idea. What if there was like a first aid kit, but for mental health? Something to guide the symptoms instead of formally preventing or formally treating it. It was a very attractive idea, and a lot of people had a lot of opinions on what would go into a box like that, from tea and chocolate to like Xanax and gin. <laughs> well, I decided to explore the more practical and legal options by revisiting academic literature and also speaking to professionals in counseling, social work, and education. It was really important to me that we made something that was usable in that time of panic, but also something credible. The end result was the pass kit, 
an acronym for Panic, Anxiety, and Stress Support. It had earplugs and a sleeping mask to block out the environmental uh, stressors of noise and light. It had a package of chewing gum and a squeezable foam stress star to relieve tension in the muscles for lessened anxiety. And it had a pack of 25 flashcards with tips of what you can do if you find yourself in that moment of panic. The flashcards were portable and based off cognitive behavioral therapy. So we'd bring up these habits or thoughts or emotions that someone might have but not notice. And if these were things that they wanted to change, we would offer them suggestions of alternative behaviors, habits, perspectives, or techniques that they could do to reduce those symptoms. Everything was referenced, concise, and friendly, ultimately usable in that time of need. I think we talk about mental health quite a bit on uh, Ontario school campuses, and rightfully so, about how mental health is important, how mental illness exists, the one in five statistic, and maybe how yoga could be helpful. But not enough about the specifics, the turbulent, disorganized thoughts, like the fears of not matching up to your peers, the disorientation from all night cramming, the guilt from the calories and the cupcake that you just ate, or maybe the brain fog that's making you think you're not smart enough to be here. But also about how hard it actually is to take up the challenge, to do something new, just so that your life might get a little better. <laughs> Stress management is tough ugly, and I found it oftentimes confusing. And I really wanted to do something to help those people on that expected or unexpected journey. So maybe a student struggling, overwhelmed by stress at 2 a.m. at night could reach for something, find a scenario that is specific to them, and follow straightforward instructions to dull those short breaths, stop those intrusive thoughts, and then when they're ready to, decide what kind of formal supports they want to access, if they want to access it. Accessibility is also very important, and although tangible tools like this are not constrained by hours of operation or are relatively glitch-free, they can be tucked away hidden in a counselor's office somewhere, where again, someone has to self-identify with their mental health symptoms before getting mental health prevention. But accessibility does not need to be given through traditional mental health channels. The University of Waterloo purchased one of these kits for all the incoming first year students during the orientation week event, independent on any mental health initiative, so that everyone could be equipped with a usable stress management tool, regardless of their mental health status or even if they were thinking about mental health at the time. But this initiative in particular was really important to us because it was also an opportunity for us to impact more than student mental health. We became connected with a local community of adults with learning disabilities, and we restarted a work program for them. So we actually hired them at the full Ontario 2018 minimum wage with vacation to put together these kits for us. Employment is a large determinant of mental health, and we were honored to be part of something so impactful for the community. I think that there's a social responsibility to entrepreneurship, and when you bring in something new to a community, you should be cognizant of what is already there and seek to cooperate instead of replacing or leaving behind. It's really tempting to disrupt the system, if you will, but sometimes these systems are not broken and just need more time, relationships, and resource mobilization. Mental health is a community effort, and it takes a lot of time and lots of great people. But in between the formal efforts of prevention and treatment, we still need ways to support people that takes the onus away from the individual to be prepared. Because not everyone can be. I sure wasn't. And these measures need to be cooperative with what already exists. Band-aids don't replace doctors, like how the Pasca will never replace counselors. But like Band-aids, we seek to control symptoms until formal help is accessible. But in all its strengths and literalness, it's still a band-aid solution, so a temporary solution that can't address the root of the problem. And this is why it's really important that we never lose sight of systematic change. I do get uh, testimonials from the people who have used the pass kit about how it stopped another panic attack, how the cars were used until that they were worn out, how it helped them study, and even how it stopped them from harming themselves in ways that they would regret today. But 
It was also a physical tool to prompt unscheduled, uncomfortable conversations, and it was something that made the students feel like the community genuinely cared about their health and well-being. And I think this is an example of the power of informal mental health tools as long as they are usable, accessible, and cooperative. <coughs> Innovation is really important. And it's really up to the people with the lived experiences and the ideas to take up the challenge to do something new just so that our lives might get a little better. But for mental health innovation, I encourage everyone to ideate passionately, but implement consciously. Because before making waves, it's really important to know what's already in the waters. Thank you. <laughs>